Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, June 24th, and welcome back to The Gist of It with Nick and Adriana. Um, this is our second episode in the Amplify series that we are really excited to be uh, moving forward with. And today we've got a special guest um, who will be talking about some Indigenous history, um, her craft, and just touching on the problematic approach to Canada Day. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, today we have Michelle from Birch Trail. I don't know what side of the screen is on. And um, we are going to have a nice long chat with her today on a couple of different topics. Um, which include talking about her craft and um, some indigenous history and the beloved Canada Day <laughs> and uh, some other things that we'll just we'll find out. <laughs> so yeah, let's, um, how's everybody doing today? Doing good, I'm doing great. Yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day and also the summer equinox, so a lot of festivities. Yeah, did you do anything fun? Um, well, uh, now, well, I'm in Quebec, so we're allowed to have 10 people over, as long as it's like outside in our backyard. So mm -hmm. I invited over like a small select people and then we made strawberry drink and Indian tacos and we pretended it was powwow season. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, that's awesome. Yeah, everything's been canceled, so it's like we're making the best that we can. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was watching the news last night because I do that. Um, and they were showing that there was a bunch of virtual celebrations happening across the nation. So it was really cool because I got like little tidbits. It was on, I think, CBC, not CTV. I don't do that anymore. Um, but there was like some really awesome Zoom collaborations that happened. So that was really nice to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, CBC has like surprised me like in I guess the past like 10 years or so. Like they've really like shifted like a lot of focus like onto like indigenous like programming and talking about indigenous issues and it's actually my fiance that got me listening to like CBC Radio 1 and every day I was like damn am I listening to APTN? Like <laughs> Yeah, honestly, it's just, it's like raw and filtered news source. Like you actually get what you need out of it. It's yeah. not like this hyper politicized emotional crap that you don't know what's true or what's just something to catch people's attention. So it's been really refreshing because my, I live with my parents right now and my dad was the one that was like, I'm done with CTV. We need to find another outlet. I can't do this anymore. So we've been watching CBC. <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> My family is just like hard on like the news news like in Canada's um, oh now the word's gonna go from my head when I went to go say it but just like you know like the sun and that kind of bullshit that's not yeah <laughs> I don't know if I can swear on this podcast please <laughs> oh you're totally fine okay yeah, cool. <laughs> I'm like if not there's gonna there might be like a lot of beeping <laughs> I'll try to hold myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's totally cool <laughs> but yeah well you said this is this is supposed to be like your Canada Day episode right <laughs> yeah that's cool <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's uh we're release we're gonna release this one this week okay right am I wrong am I right <laughs> we could do either Whoever's listening to this doesn't know what this week means so it doesn't even matter <laughs> Yeah. It is the 22nd of June. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> we have one holiday coming up here in Quebec, which is on Wednesday, which is the national holiday of Quebec. Oh. That's a fun thing. Here's, here's something interesting. Because okay. I, I, I assume I, I don't know what you're, if you're following a lot of Canadian or American or just kind of like a mix of it. But if you're in Canada, so I grew up in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I've been living in Montreal for like 10 years now. So Quebec has its own national holiday, which um, when it celebrates the colonization when the French came and whatever. 
But it's on the 24th of June, and in Quebec, on Canada Day, on the 1st, there is this lovely phenomenon called Moving Day, where we nobody celebrates Canada Day here. Well, okay, I'm not going to say that because some people do, and we have, like, stuff that the government and the municipalities do. Yeah. But in general, it's Moving Day. That's just a long weekend where everyone who is on a lease moves. <laughs> so interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> but I, ha I haven't celebrated Canada Day in like over 10 years. <laughs> and it's actually, it's actually really nice. And I will say that. <laughs> yeah, I know, like I worked for the government for oh, just over a year and a half, um, the federal government. So I was in Ottawa when that, when that was happening. So we got like the May 20, well, this year's May 18, whatever, like the Victoria Day off. Mm -hmm. um, but then like our... Quebec colleagues either in the Quebec offices or even if they were in Ontario they would get the June 24th holiday yeah and I was always really confused because I had never heard about it before I started working <laughs> for the government and then yeah it's like I mean Ottawa is obviously huge for Canada Day they do the giant like stage thing at yeah. Parliament um, but yeah most of my colleagues they just kind of like oh I'm, I'm changing my lease because I live in Gatineau so I'm busy that day doing whatever I'm gonna do and I didn't actually think that was like a thing that people did. It's such so. a big thing. Um, there's Victoria that Victoria Day holiday here but it's not called Victoria Day it's called the Journée du Patriot. Oh, okay. And we actually because you guys are in Ontario right? Yeah. So I grew up, that was my school system, was the Toronto board. And we, I don't remember ever learning about the Patriot. And basically it's like a rebellion. It's like a group of Quebecois that were like against the English. Because in Quebec, there was like a lot of like oppression towards, there was oppression towards the French people. And there was like cases of like the English, like committing acts of genocide, where they'd be burning down churches with male men and women and children inside. And then you have these group, which were called the Patriot, and they were against that. And they were all, event they were all hung at some point. So they were executed by the British. But it's just like this whole history of this whole, like, I remember in high school, how we like very lightly touched on, I don't know if it's different now. It's been like, 15 years almost since I've been in high school and that's going to age me a bit. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just remember it being like the English came and then there were some French people here and then like the plane to Abraham and we beat them and we're nice enough to let them stay here and stay in Quebec. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what we learned. I don't know they were supposed to change the curriculum this year, I think, and now they can't. Um, they've been trying to change the curriculum for years, and it's like, there's still so much problematic stuff that comes out of, like, teachers' resources. Um, there was something I shared in my 41 Day project, um, and it's like, because I did this project, like, three years ago, so it's very, like, it's recent, and it was a new teaching book, and it said, like, oh, the English inhabitants came and like the native people are just like, sure, take all this land. And they, and, and it described them as belligerent, like the belligerent natives. <laughs> and it's like, how is this still in the curriculum? I was very lucky that I had a, a history teacher in grade 10 that was just kind of like very lightly touched on it. And they're like, oh, day schools, like boarding schools. And they went and they learned how to be like, westernized which is such like a bizarre word in that sense but like but then there's all this whole history on Quebec and like the French because the French have been here like they call it they came and they settled here like way before the English and it's a huge history that we don't touch on yeah. um and especially like because there's even it's a like while the Quebec people are still like slight have been oppressed by the English they have still like contributed to their own oppression like not to their own but like to indigenous oppression on the east coast so because yeah, they've become this like separation of the rest of the English and it's weird and the, I don't know there's like this entitlement that I feel like is just never gonna go away 
<laughs> it's such like a, it's, I always, I've always referred to Canada as not a united country, but separate territories and countries. And obviously it has been like the borders that are currently up now are not reflective of Turtle Island in itself, like in its origins. So I just refer to it as its current borders, but it's like every, everything is such like a mishmash. And as an Ontarian, because we all, we, we have that like rival with the, with the Franco-Ontarians. <laughs> yeah, like, we do. <laughs> and it's funny because I'm, I'm like, I have a very, as I say it, a French ass name. <laughs> I'm, I'm a mixed human, so like, I haven't even properly introduced myself. You have to tell us about yourself. I guess we could just like cut this and put this forever. Okay. Um, but yeah, Gwe and in Delouise Michelle. So I'm all. Oh, I'm a mixed, mixed indigenous woman. I'm French, Quebecois. I'm Métis from the Great Lakes. And I'm also Mi'kmaq from out on the East Coast. And I'm also Irish and Scottish. I've got quite like a big mix in there. Uh, no. <laughs> My last name's Beauséjour. So growing up in Ontario, I got like Nobody could ever pronounce my name. <laughs> I was afraid of, I, I was afraid I was going to pronounce it wrong because I didn't, I, yeah, for the longest time I haven't been able to figure it out, honestly. That's so, okay. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is now that I live in Quebec, and if I say my name with an English accent, because that's like how I've been raised, people are just like, what's your name? And they'd be like, Michelle Beausager, and they'd be like, Misha Bourgeois, and that's like, why are we doing this again? So I have to like accentuate my accent and I have to be like, Michel Beausejour. It's like, <laughs> very like, <laughs> and they're like, oh yes, okay. It means yeah. like a beautiful holiday or something. <laughs> That's a nice, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a beautiful day, beautiful, yeah, beautiful holiday. Like a sejour is like a holiday, but like, let's go away for the day or like, let's go to a bed of breakfast or something. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, um, I'm an artist. I do a lot of things. Yeah, so yeah. like, <laughs> um, I'm an artist. I make jewelry. Um, my professional training is in fashion design. I went to the International Academy of Design and Technology in Toronto which unfortunately is bankrupt and does not exist anymore. But don't, if you're gonna go to private post-secondary, please double think about it. <laughs> That's my <laughs> <opinion>. <laughs> Like stories about, like I know someone right now who's trying to get their real estate license at a private school and they're shutting down in August. And he's like, yeah, I'm not even half done, but I, I, ha I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so yeah. And it's really shitty because once the school goes bankrupt, your diploma is not worth much of anything. And you can't really get like a provincial equivalent through like when you get it through a private school. But what I learned is it's mostly your portfolio that matters and your experience in my, in my case. How long was that program? Uh, the program was two years. So it was like an accelerated course and then halfway through the program, things got shut down. Um, we were supposed to have a class action suit that never went through. Fashion design students. It was like the early 2000s. Like I finished in 2006 and then I moved out to Montreal in 2008. What, uh, what made you move out to Montreal? First it was a boy and then I <laughs> stayed for the city. <laughs> You'll get like a lot of people that come to Montreal. Montreal is like, Montreal and Quebec is amazing in the sense that there's so many like, it's very like socially based. So you'll get a lot of resources for like the social programs, art. Um, I find that I was able to like live in Montreal as an artist and pay for myself and have my work valued rather than being in Toronto. And I don't want to I don't want to rip on Toronto. That's my hometown. I grew up in Regent Park, so hey, everybody, before I moved to Scarborough. But um, yeah, so I lost my train of thought. That's, that's I just so like brain farted right there. 
you're saying that it's it was it's easier for you to live in Montreal and thrive yeah. as an artist than in Toronto, and I totally agree with that. Yeah. I'm also in the, I'm in the photo industry, but I have a lot of art friends too, and it's just it's not really possible. No, Montreal turns as a place where like we're known for like where people go find themselves. It's like, did you cut your bangs and shake your head and go to Montreal? Like, <laughs> go there for a boy, like, or a girl, or whoever, a lovely person. <laughs> I stayed for the city. I connected with my maker group out here back then, and I had an Etsy shop. So I started getting involved um, in teams. And I'm one of the co-founders of um, the Collective Creative Etsy Montreal, which going forward is to be known as the Collective Creative Montreal, because we've grown so much over the past years from being just like a community-led Etsy group to now I do markets full time. And they're like, like I do like larger scale markets. Um, so we have about 100 artists. And we do this four times a year. So that's one of my jobs <laughs> when I'm not making things. Yeah, they're really cool. I've, I see you post about them all the time. And I'm like, next time I go to Montreal, I want to plan around it so I can go. Yeah, and there's so many community teams all across Canada. There's one like in the Niagara area. There's one um, in Toronto. And I think one of you is from Hamilton. I think there's a team. Yeah, out, yeah. yeah there's a team out in Hamilton too. And there's just like teams all across Canada. And it's like this amazing phenomenon uh, to the point where the actual company Etsy was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Let's try to do some kind of campaign together. So in September, there's something called Made in Canada or in Quebec, it's called Feo Quebec. And um, basically it's like markets all across Canada on that same day uh, organized through the community members. So that was cool. That was kind of like a recognition of like what we were doing before Etsy kind of tanked when they went open and they have their new CEO. And now their policies are exceedingly restrictive upon indigenous makers. Yeah. Yeah. I think you <clears throat> talked about that when you were on um, Missing Witches. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I remember hearing about that and I was just like, how, how, how do you like go from this really great company supporting all this and then a new CEO comes in and is like, well, you know what, actually. No. Mm. Well, I've worked with, well, I haven't worked with, I'll state it because we're not paid by the company. Mm -hmm. They offered us a very small sponsorship for that one show. Okay. And then we also have like a summit, which takes place in Toronto once a year. And that's where like all the captains from across Canada and leaders get together and it's supposed to be like a think tank and it's supposed to help Etsy like kind of like move forward as a company. And we've been doing this for seven years. Um, and just kind of like them tapping into the community and seeing what's going on. And there was myself and a small group of people and a couple of the staff that were kind of trying to work towards like making change, like more inclusive policy, let's tackle your horrendous appropriation problem. Mm -hmm. Like if you've ever, like Etsy has an issue with resellers, with people who are doing mass appropriation. And I get it that you can only have so many admins going in and removing things at once. Mm -hmm. But um, we were trying to like basically make inclusive policy for people like myself and my friends who use animal parts in our craft. Mm -hmm. And they're telling us that we can't sell them online because of international laws. Meanwhile, it's an American company and the laws within North America are very different rather than wanting to please people who have racist views based on things like the seal hunt out in Europe where it's like, they're not even faced with it but so we've tried for like quite a few years to enact change on this and there's been a lot of resistance and I'm I'm at like the final stages in my dealings of them right now I've, I've uh, closed my Etsy shop and I'm putting my focus taking my focus out of like teaching settlers 
and sensitizing them through my work there and focusing it on Indigenous artists and creating opportunities for them instead. So I've started a new project. It's a kind of like a collective called Turtle Island Makers, which is on hold right now because of COVID. <laughs> of course. But um, that's kind of like the same kind of thing I'm doing at the Collective Montreal, but just geared towards like Indigenous artists only. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. You have to watch out for it once you can keep going with it after COVID. Definitely, definitely. And um, so yeah, that's like a bit about like what I do. I also um, been doing divination for over 20 years. Um, I self-identify as a witch. Um, I've been doing tarot professionally for like about a year or two now. I also do Reiki. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> there we go. <laughs> I've, do, I've done construction before. I used to work with my dad in like residential and commercial construction. I have like a lot of hats. <laughs> you do. You're, what's that phrase? Jill of all trades right now. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. I really love your mug, by the way. I noticed it earlier, the scissors. Thanks. A good friend of mine bought it for me just when I, and it's funny because I started like since COVID hit, we've all had to like really adapt. So mm -hmm. all of my markets have been canceled and that's like my main line of income. Um, and I just started making masks after my, my roommate was like, can you help me make a mask? So I decided to teach him and then we decided to post them online. And every time I post something online, I have like 10 people that are like, can you make that for me? <laughs> Which is a good problem. And I love to offer that service, <laughs> but now I'm, I think by the t by in two weeks I will have sewn like five hundred masks up to date. Whoa! It's I've I have an order of two hundred that's going to a homeless shelter network here. That's amazing. Um, that I've donated money to in the past, and um, also for the Native Friendship Center here. Uh, that's Native Montreal. So that is a lot of masks <laughs> and a lot of sewing. <laughs> yeah. That is not a skill I have, so I definitely commend you for it because I don't think I could fix a hole in a shirt if I tried. Oh, I've been sewing since I was 10. It was like my first love, like one of my very first loves. And I had like the old ass like sewing machine that was stuck in the desk Aww. with like the big pedal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah. But yeah, um, we wanted to talk a bit about like how about Canada Day celebrations, I think, and also like a little bit about how people can acknowledge and what yeah. they can do. <clears throat> and um, I, cause I, cause I have all my notes and stuff. And of course we're never gonna go like in with the, the notes when I was expecting them to. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a one, there was one um, phrase that I wanted to throw out and just like kind of for your listeners to like sit and think about it. And it's just, that was the, um, the very first copy of the Indian Act. And that was in 1880. And one of the things that I've always sticked out and it was one of the first things I shared in my 41 day project was the term person means an individual other than an Indian. And that is how it's stated in the first copy of the Indian Act. And we want to talk about like the origins of Canada. We want to talk about like this kind of thing and celebration. And it's like my per like I've gathered like some from various sources. Cause like my personal opinion is always gonna be like, there's no way in hell you can celebrate Canada Day. <laughs> <laughs> Like Canada Day has been founded, like yeah. just like in like the genocide of Indigenous peoples. And I know that people have been like inundated with this, like on the radio, and they hear it a lot, but they don't really really think a lot deeper than that. Everything's like really like lightly touched, like what we saw with like Black Lives Matter and every like the whole death with Floyd, and then of course we have two Indigenous deaths 
that are like in such a close span from each other right in Canada by our, our, our RCMP. Mm. And you have like this wave and like performative allyship where people go in and be like, now I care. Here's my black square. Let me flood your hashtags. <laughs> like, let me just completely like disregard like anything that's happening in the movement to be like, I'm not one of those white people. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I think a lot of that is where if you want to like really think deep into it and if you really want to like deconstruct how you can celebrate the land that you're inhabiting, um, it's to like actually deconstruct it and learn it. And that's like, that's, that's the hard part because we have, um, I was learning about it recently, but it's like one of my friends was um, quoting Eve Tuck and Eve Tuck, Tuck does, she does, did this, um, it's called uh, decolonization, decolonization is not a metaphor. And basically, I think it's like well put out and it's a good resource to go read, especially as a settler or, and that you're looking for because you'll hear like, you'll hear a lot of people talk about decolonization and they're not really sure like what it means, how it applies. They're like, well, what do you mean? Do you mean we actually have to like give the land back? <laughs> <laughs> like you'll see the youth and you'll be like land back and decolonization and it's like and they aren't metaphors they really aren't metaphors like indigenous land is only 0.2 percent and crown land is insane there's so much crown land and it's like it's really it's not a metaphor like give the land back <laughs> like <laughs> and um in in decolonization is not a metaphor they talk about like how settlers this like move to settler innocence where you have people it's like well it's not me it wasn't i didn't do anything to you um we didn't know it was so long ago and that's like that's part of the deflecting that's part of like the performative like allyship that we that we see right now um and it's i'm just trying to collect my thoughts <laughs> and read my things <laughs> And it's, oh yeah, because I tied this into something that I was listening to recently. <laughs> and have you heard of the Mandela effect? <laughs> uh, vaguely, yeah. <laughs> so basically it's like, it's, it's, it's a mass false memory. And like the best example of this is, you know, who can prevent forest fires? And everybody goes, Smokey the Bear, but that's not even his name. Really? His name's Smokey Bear. Oh, oh. So people call him Smokey the Bear specifically because of a, a, a jingle that came out in the 50s. And the way to make it like rhyme was Smokey the Bear. Oh. And it's stuck. Yeah. And that's like in our collective mass memory now is Smokey the Bear when that's not his name. Or Looney Tunes. If you ask someone to spell you Looney Tunes, they're going to say T-O-O-N. But the, it's tunes like in a tune, like yeah. a song. So it's like, yeah, there's a couple <laughs> other things too. There's like, um, I think there was a cereal or something, a cereal box that was different. If you Google it, there's like, just Google it, yeah. all these different things. It's really interesting. <laughs> it's super in interesting. And it was actually because it was named after like Nelson Mandela because he, they, his death was falsely announced in the 80s. And of course, he spent like a lot of time in jail. So there wasn't really, media was very different at that time, as we all know. Yes. So when they actually announced his actual death, like in 2013, some people thought he was still dead. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, wait, what? I thought he died back in the 80s. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't even know that that was related to Nelson Mandela. Like, because I feel like if I asked my parents, my mom would probably assume that he died in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so weird how we can just, like, fabricate a story and it becomes, like, this memory that everybody has. Exactly. And it's, like, 
a lot of it's because it's like if you think about like commercials and like on a greater beast capitalism and like how they infiltrate our memory base by like repetitive jingles repetitive slogans and then like that's really like what we talk about like your words matter and words matter and there's reasons why like you shouldn't keep calling like you shouldn't call a native person an indian mm -hmm. but it's just like people are like i believe it's in the collective memory that it's like it's so long ago it's so like forever and you just need to get over it because you get so much like free stuff yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. and it's like it's really it's and then it's all in the way that it's it's taught to us in our school systems, the way it's worded. And like, I, like, I don't know, I made those two connections like the other day when I was listening to that podcast and I was like, damn, like this, this explains like a lot of like where settler innocence like gets its origins and where it's coming from. And like, just from that repetitiveness. Cause like, if I go like, like growing up, so my personal story is my grandmother's initially from Nova Scotia, but she was removed. So she experienced um, residential schooling. She was never returned to her family. She ended up getting dumped into an orphanage, ends up in Toronto at some point. And um, people are like, oh, so long ago. And I'm like, that's, that's like actually my grandmother. <laughs> like it's actually my parents and kids are being removed through the foster care system at an, like an insane amount right now. It's worse than residential school systems. And it's like the last residential school system closed in 96. Like it's really not that long ago. Like, no, like we were born. Yeah. That, that, like, cause we we're 95 babies and I remember the first time hearing about residential schools. I was like, I was a teenager. I couldn't tell you exactly how old I was, but I was blown away that that they hadn't fully closed until I was almost a year old, if not a year old already at that point. And it was just mm -hmm. like, or even talking to my parents, like my dad, my both my parents were born in the sixties. Um, and like my, my parents are learning a lot right now and just like they have, they never knew, like they just had no idea and they were like, I don't understand how we didn't learn this in school or how we didn't see it happening beside us. And for my dad, he moved all across. I think he lived in like nine locations before the age of 15. So like he was in Winnipeg at one point all through Quebec and he just has no recollection of any of that happening because they were just so quiet about it it was just happening under the radar it's so true and it's like my both uh both of my indigenous grandparents died before i was 10. so my grandmother who experienced um the worst of it i would say um she died when i was six she was only 52. Oh um God. from what we understood it was from a loss of circulation to her brain um, it could have been a lot of like other underlying problems. Like she was like, well, from what my mom told me, there was a lot of like very obvious signs of abuse. She had iron marks on her back. There was like a lot of her like growing up. She was, she instilled in my mother that um, we're Indians. We need to be proud of that. Like, but not like, there's no grasp on where she's from because that's been removed, like violently removed from her. And it wasn't until after she died and after my grandparents died that we started doing like our own like family research and just kind of like, okay. Cause, and I've told this story before cause I love this story. Cause I always say that if you're Canadian and even if you're American, because if you're American, they have their Cherokee princess story. But if you're Canadian, you have, you have like, oh, we have the native grandmother princess story. And it's like that, my family members, like my aunts got caught up on that a little bit. And so it's like, oh, it's a chief's daughter, whatever. So I went into our lineage and I was like, well, this is where she comes from. This is where it stops. This is where there's no more information because genocide. 
Um, and then going through on my grandfather's side, which is her husband. And then we like looked into his Métis line, where he comes from. We come from both the Great Lakes, from Superior, Lake Superior. Then part of our line splits out to the Red River. But <clears throat> we had like, like my grandfather was very estranged from his family. There's like, we didn't have like, like I grew up with a lot of pan-Indigenous teachings. Mm -hmm just because a lot of people don't realize like how Canadian policy has just constantly been removing um, culture. Like it's all been like, it's just to kill indigenous people. I'm just gonna like be very blunt. I can't word this in a pretty way right now. <laughs> no need to either. <laughs> and it's like, so I put that, I wrote down like a couple facts because I think that always likes to put the thing into perspective and we think in terms of the residential school system. Because in the, like through the TRC, it's like residential schools were missing uh, like half the records because they burned the records and they destroyed the records. So this wouldn't be found out. We were still, they're still finding like mass grave sites and things like that. So. At the end of the TRC, the numbers were too high to even come up with a final number. Like it's not even an estimated final number. But just the way to put it in perspective, like in World War II, if you were in World War II, your chances of dying were one in 26. If you went to residential schooling, your chances of dying of more are one in 25. Wow. So you had a higher chance of death than, world, than going and serving in World War II. And it's like one of the most notorious residential schools was right in Ontario and it was St. Anne's Residential School. And they're not the only one that's known for having electrical chairs, but they had a homemade electrical chair that they used on the children. And it's like, it's, 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 a, it's a bit, it's like, it's rough. And I know that a lot of people might be going through a lot of feelings when they hear these kinds of things and a lot of it might like, it's okay to just sit with it. Like, in all this, we're not saying it's your fault, but being complacent and silent in, while we're like talking about this and while we're facing it is just as violent mm -hmm. as, as almost doing it itself because it still is perpetuating the genocide that takes place today. Now we see, now we don't have residential schoolings. Now we have, the foster care system which is horrendous um yeah. most of my aunts spent a lot of their time in and out of foster care and the stories from foster care are never good um my current fiance's ex-girlfriend um dealt with very very abusive times with the foster care system that was before her mom became one of uh missing and murdered or missing and or murdered never heard from this again but it's just like it's like, if you are not, if you don't hear about these stories, or if these stories are not in your circle, you don't, you don't have Indigenous people in your circle. And then you need to ask yourself why. Because every single Indigenous person that I know, including myself, either A, has a residential school story, or B, has a murder, missing and murdered story. Mm -hmm. On top of the other things, like systemic racism and whatever else but um sorry i'm stuck to my chair it's hot it's hot there <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like that's how we're looking at like how we're looking at through the past we have things like the potluck ban which bans ceremony because people don't realize that ceremony was banned up until the 50s and it was later in quebec um, so that means we can participate in our ceremonies, we couldn't make our crafts, because that's literally like part of like ceremony too. Mm -hmm. Can make crafts, can make regalia, can be seen with this. If you were caught, you'd have all your stuff confiscated and then you might find it in a museum. Yeah. But, um, so there is that. And then we're going, going forward like and where we see this now is 
specifically in still in the dispossession of native land, like we see with the building of pipelines. Yeah. And like 0.2% is native land. Mm -hmm. We're at the moment and you have to build a freaking pipeline right there, like right through there. Like, I'm not gonna like even talk about the pipelines in the first place. Like, it's a whole other can. It's a whole yeah. other, exactly. Yeah. And it's in the, um, it was in the missing and murdered women are the final report. Cause we've done, we've had a lot of commissions in Canada. We had the TRC, which had 96 calls to action to the government, mm -hmm. the missing and murdered final report, 231 calls to action. So this like went up and like, it's just like even decimated the TRC. And one of the things that is like, one of the biggest uh, problems of this is man camps. And if you don't know what a man camp is, it's basically an encampment where pipeline workers stay while they're building a pipeline. And these people are, ex usually they're placed by indigenous communities and usually the rates of missing women goes up exponentially, the rate of rape, the rate of murder, the rate of abuse. And I, there's a couple activists that I follow that are like at a couple of the blockades that are out in BC. And if you follow any activists in your circle, they're just like, they're constantly being harassed every day by the RCMP. They show up to their encampments, which is on their land first off. Mm -hmm. So they're just calling up, doing checks on them to harass them. Um, recently, there was one of the one of the pipeline workers, and this person was sharing a video on their Instagram. They had they, this pipeline worker stole her truck and drove it into her house, like it's like this pole that was there. And then it's just like this is all like on video that she shared, and the guy is just like irate and belligerent, and like nothing's being nothing's being done about this. And we had we had so much mom momentum before COVID. Yeah. And now since COVID, it's just like any momentum that we gained is now lost. And this news is nowhere on people's minds. No. And it's like, I've had a few friends come talk to me, especially like um, other settler friends. And they're just kind of like, where did it go? Like, there's no, like, I don't see anything on Black Lives Matter anymore. And I don't see anything on Indigenous, like, like, sovereignty or rights or like any of these movements and I'm like you're following the wrong people you're relying on your news to come from like the dodo and you want it to be like look at how cute <laughs> this is there's like this happy animal like that was like yeah. nested in a pipeline or some <laughs> bullshit I don't know <laughs> oh my gosh the dodo I, I see their articles on Facebook and I'm like they're no like this can't even be a thing that I'm seeing right now oh man like some of it's so cute, like I like the little animal stories and shit like that. But it's like I just see pe people are relying up on news to be pre-shared before they go in, and then they share it, and they're like, "Here's my little badge I cared for this weekend, and now it's over." And yeah. that's like, I think that's like a lot of like where the allyship there's like mistaken allyship, like it's this thing that you did and you achieved it and now it's finished. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's ever, like it's a constant relationship. Like it's a constant growing, it's a constant learning, it's a constant adapting. Yeah. It's not something you can just like pick up and drop off and be like, okay, I added that one to my brownie belt. Now I'm just gonna like yeah. continue on to the next one. It's something that's like, it's like a constant learning. And I know it's heavy. It's really heavy, and that's where self-care comes to the forefront. But and you're always going to hear like, if you're uncomfortable, imagine what people feel like dealing with it every day. Yeah. And like, I guess like I can't I can't speak on behalf of all Indigenous people. I can only speak on behalf of my experience, and my experience will not be will not come from like a heavily marginalized perspective because I'm white passing. 
and I've been dealt. Like, I am white passing and white coated and the privilege that I have allows me to walk in the world and not be, not be like judged against other than my tattoos, which is a different story. <laughs> but <laughs> that's yeah. not the, that's not the same thing at all. That's not the same like ramifications at all. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I guess like one of the, I guess a good like example I can talk about that people, cause now with COVID and the mass buying and stuff, people are kind of like dealing with like the concept of food security and like security for the first time. Um, and it's like people, people don't know how to deal with it. Like when they go went and bought all the freaking toilet paper, like <laughs> all the hand sanitizer and Lysol wipes. And then the increase in bidet commercials everywhere. Like you don't need toilet paper, just get a bidet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was a wild time. Yeah. And it's like, these are just like few examples of like things Indigenous people have been dealing with like for a long time. Like back during all the potluck bans and um, basically pe Indigenous people weren't allowed to leave their reservation unless uh, so their reserve, we're not Americans. Um, <laughs> Uh, they weren't allowed to leave the reserve without permission from the Indian agent, and the Indian agent was someone assigned from the government of Canada. So obviously not an Indigenous person. <laughs> Why would you do that? Not. <laughs> <laughs> so you get your permission, and of course because of um, European patriarchal society, it usually only fell on the men that would be allowed to leave the reserve. And um, Oh, where was I going with this? So yeah, so it would only be men that would be allowed to leave the reserve. And it would usually be the hunter stuff, and that's kind of like how they keep their ceremonies alive. Um, so then you have like women who, in a lot of cases, a lot of indigenous nations are matriarchal. Or if they're not matriarchal, if they're patriarchal, they hold their, they, women are held in high like regard like they're held on councils the ones that make decisions too and even then if we like go back back and want to talk about language bases and things like that like there is no word for like men and women it's just like the people so like we never felt like there were no like binaries basically so you have like women who are very used to like having like a lot of say and being rega regarded in a high like manner and then you have the men who can only like, preserve and preserve their ceremonies whereas women are not allowed so um that was that was up until the 50s <laughs> wow but um sorry i lost my train of thought again <laughs> helps guide me <laughs> no you're honestly it's like <laughs> I feel like I'm going all over the place. <laughs> it's, but it like it makes sense though because it like it flows and each idea you need to continuously like make that information concrete in our minds. Like for me, you're just first of all you're a bit full of information. I'm and I'm still learning as much as I can. But it's just that's the only thing I ever learned about Indigenous people in high school from my memory um, was in grade 11 religion. We went to Catholic school. We oh. did, it was called world religion. So it was everything but Catholic. And there was a whole unit on native spirituality is what it was called. And I just remember being in awe of like women being in such a high place in their communities because you don't hear that in other religions. You don't hear that in normal society on a daily basis and it was just like this really small snapshot and that was it that's all we got and so it's just i oh man i love listening to you talk right now <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh that goes into another beast like the new age community i'm yeah. someone who identifies as a witch and like a, like i don't know if I'm, i think i'm moving away from the term pagan it's like growing up like people because i'm white coated people 
just the first thing they're gonna be like, oh, like, yeah, sure, you need it. <laughs> like, sure. Yeah. Okay. And then they'll go, but wait, how much? It's like, I don't know, genetics don't work in percentages. That's pseudoscience. I'm not even gonna get into DNA testing and how <laughs> that's like not based. Like you can't scientifically base that in it. Anyways, <laughs> a, good, a good podcast episode to listen to if you're someone who's like, maybe I should get a genetic DNA test is All My Relations podcast. And they speak with a doctor who is able to break all that down and why DNA tests are pseudoscience and they won't tell you what culture you are. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Yeah. no. We'll link that because um, I took genetics in university and I remember my genetics teacher got up at the front of the lecture hall and he was like, 23 and me, you've all heard that, right? And we're like, yeah, we know what it is. And he's like, it's bullshit, throw it out the window. And like half my class had had one done. And I was like, yeah, I'm glad I'm not that person that wasted like 300 bucks on a test because there is wow. nothing to do it. Now, the only thing I will positively say about a DNA test is that a lot of people who have been removed through the foster care system, it's a great way to find your family. Yeah. It's a great way to find blood relatives because like I guess you'd share that DNA and like and I know people who have used it to find like ancestry, but that won't like tell you your culture. Like I don't it's like that's not that's that's doesn't and GNE is so different because there's so many facets to in GNE, like your culture. But then like there's oftentimes we forget about kinship. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people are confused at like the concept of who the Metis people are. <laughs> that's like one good example because it's like it's 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 a culture that's like basically based in like the mixing of other of other cultures, but it's like very distinct in its own. It's like it's like Quebecois. Like when you live like everywhere else in Canada, it's like when we talk about French, we usually were talking about Quebec people. But in Quebec, if you're talking about French people, you're talking about people in France. And yeah. that's the Quebecois. And it's like it's this, it's similar on that matter. And a lot of people get confused by the term Metis because of the the Eng uh, the French language base of the word, which is Metis, which means to be mixed. Mm -hmm. Now, back in the day like in the whole HBC companies and like when there was Métis settlements and that kind of thing. What we were called back then was just half-breeds. That's how we were labeled. Half-breed communities, half-breed children. And it's like, it's a, that is just another example of genocide and how they want to like rip like uh, indigenous people away from Canada and North America. Mm -hmm. So it's like all in like different policies and things enabled to just like remove indigenous people like blood quantum. Mm -hmm. um, um, like, uh, like, like, for example, a status native. We always assume like, that's going to cover everybody. Inuit people are not status, status Indians. Um, and I say Indian because it's still called the Indian Act. And we're still called Indians like to the government. This has not been changed. Um, and that's like, so the Métis Nation, which was born out of Red River and existed within the Western provinces up into Ontario. And you have a lot of like people that are just like, oh yeah, Métis means mixed. It's not like, the reason, like it was called the Métis Nation just because y'all called us half-breeds before. And I don't know if I'd be like, this is the half-breed nation. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> And it's, it's, it, there's so many cultural specific things about Métis, like or the language, the Métis language, which is basically like a combination of, depending on where you're from, um, if you're from the Ontario Métis Nation, if you're Anishinaabe uh, Métis mixed, it would be like Anishinaabe based. But if you're from, uh, from the Red River, it's Cree. So you have a mix of French and Cree or French and Ojibwe or French and Anishinaabe. And it's just kind of like this awesome mishmash of the language. And there's like, just so many like cultural specific things. And the HBC company tried to wipe us out too. So that's another, that's an interesting thing for Canadians to uh, do a little research onto the history of the HBC company and how horrible they are and how they gave us smallpox blankets. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's another thing too like we in like going back to like the school system we learned that you know the hbc came in and they like brought so much to like revenue to canada and stuff where we yeah. didn't learn about what they actually did <laughs> they position it like they revolutionized trading yeah. and yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> now that i'm older i've now learned so much more and that's not at all what they were here for no exactly and it's like i was looking into this because i was trying to like the metis people had the Pem uh, the pemmican wars which was like when they were trying to when the hbc company was trying to overhunt our, our bison basically to starve us out as and that's another thing that you can look into is like how the bison population was decimated not only from canada but from the united states as well as a means of genocide to starve us out um the hbc company like back, like basically they like they've like the quote was like they've claimed and traded eight million square kilometers of the earth that is the hbc company and they started and there was two of them there was a northwest country company and then the hbc company and those were the two that like Usually, like, if you see Métis people flying a Métis flag, you'll see it in red or in blue, and that usually will define, like, which company they were working for, where they originated from in that time. But, um, yeah, and it was all, like, the fur trades, and it's, like, the mass supply and demand, and it was just, like, it, it was another means of genocide. That's, like, another facet of it. And it's just, like, another old another old structure that we cannot look at constructively or deconstruct it's just like okay but that's not what it is now like it's like um if i want to talk about micmac specific like uh, micmac specific things there is still a scalping law that's set in place out in the east coast and basically you could get uh, 10 guineas for every Indian taken or destroyed. What? And so this is interesting because we always hear about scalping and we always think that the natives are like coming out and scalping, but the origins of scalping are from settlers. And that's how you could prove that you've killed a native person is because you have their scalp with their long hair. Yeah. Wow. So. I remember last year I was in um, Auntie Guinness. I did a fellowship through St. Francis Xavier at the Cody Institute and so when we were there um, on campus like doing some workshop stuff um, one of their I don't know if she's a professor at the university anyway she works in the like indigenous office and so she hosted a blanket exercise for us mm -hmm. and so I had done one in Ontario um, through the University of Ottawa so but i was really excited about this one because it would give me another perspective and that's when i first learned about the the scalping like regulation and just it was so eye-opening because it's just another piece of history that i don't know i mean i don't know enough about what happened in ontario where i currently like live and grew up but then to also have to learn so much more about like somewhere that's not far from us and it, it should be a part of our community, but it's not. It's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember it. She was so phenomenal. I wish I remembered her name because she's just like, oh, so, so much information and let us ask so many questions. And I love blanket exercises. I highly mm -hmm. recommend them because they, I don't think you could ever do enough as a settler. Like, I, I mean, every time I was able to learn something new and get a new perspective on what I was learning. So. Mm -hmm. There's like an amazing, like, I don't, I, I'm not gonna say an amazing thing coming, coming out of settler colonialism, colonialism, but it's like, it's called unsettling. Cause you'll have the mistake of like, um, I've heard like in the mouths of a lot of settlers, like decolonization, how can we decolonize as settlers? And I'm like, you can't decolonize a settler, that's called unsettling. <laughs> so that's like that's like something else that like it's really like looking at the thing that I was telling from Eve Tuck like decolonization is not a metaphor something that's really going to help you like break down like okay what is decolonization what is settle unsettling how can I unsettle as a settler um how can I like 
how can I understand land back in the actual like equitable distribution of land back to indigenous people? Like it kind of like breaks it down. Like I think people, I think I think a lot of the misconception is is like, but we can't just go back to Europe. <laughs> And it's like, like, it's like, we're not, we're, first off, we're not there yet. We can't talk about that because we have like this whole other like yeah. curve we need to flatten if I want to word it like that. <laughs> yeah. But like, like we understand that people understand that that's not going to like happen. But it's just like, how can we get to a place where we can actually like move forward to talk about that? But not, I don't mean shipping all back to Europe. <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> trying to like live together. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much information that can be found and like going back to what people see online, like you see something and you repost it, but you're not actually going in yourself and doing the work yourself. And I think like in talking about like Canada Day, people need to actually like go and do the research themselves and find out and learn why there are problems and where they stem from because if you don't know where they stem from then what's, what's the point you need to exactly and we need to like we need to gain momentum because it's like now we have the new like like the new wave and like which which is coming out and like spirituality and like appropriation which is like a whole other beast and like the new age community mm -hmm. and that's like it's it's like now in recently like sage and smudging like just the term smudging has like been popping up so much and it's not something that I've like it's not like I've been a witch for like over 20 years and it's not we didn't hear about smudging back in like the early days of witchcraft I think it's something that's like new and the new age community does, I find, like to coin a lot of terms off of the backs of like the indigenous community. Like you have a lot of youth that are talking about like, you know, we are like the daughters of the matriarchs you can murder. And then now you have all these witches, like we're the granddaughters of the witches you can burn. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you, your grandmother's not from the burning times. Like, <laughs> I just go throw that one out there. You're, that's is not the same thing. Like, I, like, like we have like a similar fight against capitalism, which I like, I associate Catholic capitalism and the Catholic church as the same beast. Cause those are the, it's the same thing. The church brought capitalism. Yeah. Anyways. So it's like, we are fighting the same patriarchal capitalist society, but it's like, you're, you can't like, <laughs> you, you can't just like do it on the backs of like indigenous people too. Like anyways, if your witchcraft and your feminism isn't intersectional, just just close this podcast now and leave. <laughs> I don't know if you're not learning anything. <laughs> oh my gosh, I liked that. <laughs> oh shit! So. Because I, my lovely business partner, who's this wonderful um, woman who's from Argentina, who's been living in um, in Canada for like over ten years, maybe close to twenty years now. Because you sent me questions before we start this, and it was like, how can we celebrate Canada Day? And I'm like, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like you can't. So, but I know that Canada, as a place provides a lot of opportunities for people. So I decided to reach out to my business partner through my markets and be like, hey, can you tell me your opinion as a person who's immigrated here? How can you celebrate Canada Day? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, she's, um, I have her answer in front of me. So it's really long. I'm gonna give you a summary of it. And it's just like, she's always, she, she said that she's never had like patriotic feelings but just like kind of talking about how Canada always comes off as the one that's better than everyone else. And I agree, like there's, we are better than other countries where there's like mass genocide, especially like in Southern America, where they're just like, 
the, the indigenous people there are being murdered, activists are being straight up murdered, and it's not even like a, oh, they, it's not like in Canada where they just like go missing or commit suicide or like magically something happens to them. Yeah. It's like they are straight up murdered and they're just like, yeah, they got murdered because they were an activist and we want to continue cutting the Amazon forest or whatever else. But, um, so like, I really get that. Like, I get that Canada stands for great things for a lot of people who are coming from like very marginalized places, very worn torn countries mm -hmm. and that it can provide opportunities for them. And that like how Canada has become this like multicultural beast. But I find I've been listening a lot to, and I will recommend her as well. And it's uh, Marisa De La Pena. Mm -hmm. And um, she is someone who's working on a project called Not Your Ancestors. And initially her, her um, expertise is appropriation within spiritual communities. But like, it's, it all intersects at some point. Everything is like that mass beast. That's like, kind of like the whole concept of like, you know, like that manifest destiny, like let's completely wipe out like North America of their indigenous populations. And I just have like, I, cause we were talking about the mass, the mass memory loss thing. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, we were talking about how words and things are important. And especially like when it comes to like the noble savage and how we've been de depicted as like the noble savage who lives like in a wigwam and that's it. But people don't, don't understand that there was, that when Columbus landed, and first off, Columbus never landed in North America. He landed in the Bahamas. Well, he got lost. <laughs> and it's like, you have, like, there was mass empires there, like mass empires. If you look at the Mayan civilizations, the Inca civilizations, they had huge societies. They had their own like, like aqueducts and shit like that. Like it was like their whole like farming, like, and we're always like painted in the idea that it was just like a bunch of naked people around a fucking wigwam. <laughs> like, it is, it's not that at all. Like we have like our own systems of like, there's multiple systems of governance, thousands of years of experience in building this governance and how to work with the land and how to farm the land in a way that will not harm it. And that we can think about the seven generations before us. Cause that's always like a big teaching. It's like in the seven generations, it's like, you'll hear it like a lot of pan teachings like this, but it's like every, thing that you do, you should think about the next seven generations that are coming before you and the seven generations that just passed. So it's like always keeping in mind, like, so you don't have that mass memory loss. You're like, this is what we should change going forward because this happened in the past. And if we do this now, this will affect our future generations like this. And we don't have that now. Like that's, something that's completely completely gone and now we're painted as like naked people around a fire <laughs> <laughs> and I like I laugh like like I laugh like it's like it's not funny like but like at this like like right now like if you can't paint if you can't teach with humor I don't think like that's just like my method of teaching anyways. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back to my friend, she's just like talking about how she would have had way better opportunities here. Mm -hmm. And like, there's no way that she would have been like as successful or even like where she is, like a homeowner, a business owner, like two kids that are healthy and don't have to worry about what's gonna be happening like next week or if there's gonna be a riot or something, so. And that's where I understand that op that opportunity. And I just wish that like new people like coming into Canada would just have a better understanding of like the land itself, mm -hmm. like pre-colonial borders. Um, there's a great website where you can actually do this and it's like native-land.ca. And 
you can type in your city or your postal code and it will tell you the indigenous land that you are currently occupying. And that's, that's a great way to start if you want to like, if you want to celebrate the land itself. Um, because June is Indigenous Peoples, yeah. National Indigenous Peoples Month. And um, the 21st is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And it corresponds with Equinox because Equinox is very important um, for various nations. But um, yeah, that's one great place to start is literally where you're standing. And that website's a good place to start. And then you go from there. And Google, Google is your friend. Stop, <laughs> stop. I love, you want to know I love sending? Um, Cause you can send a link that's like, I'll Google, let me Google this for you. Yeah. yeah. That was my favorite. Yeah. Don't stop asking your native friends to explain why we're humans to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in this case, Google is your friend. Google is your friend. And just like deconstructing, like and another place you can start, just deconstructing like the views on how you think a native person should look or act or be. Um, just because like, and a lot of this is influenced from early colonial times where you'd have painters that would come over and they'd cherry pick who they wanted to paint. Mm -hmm. um, and they would kind of like to do that whole depiction of the noble savage. Meanwhile, like people like the Vikings touched base on like Newfoundland, like what way before that. You have Jacques Cartier, Cornwallis, and all these other people on the East Coast that have been there for a while. And it's like trade already started, like for the most part, before like a lot of the heavy like um, advertisement to come to like the new world, as they say it, started happening. And so like you'd have like people would be wearing top hats, you'd have a lot of like gender fluid people and people don't like that. They you'd have like dandy type guys with umbrellas and it's like we don't want to paint those people, we want to paint oh. the dark ones with the big noses. Like so we can depict this like what they look like, the whole like idea of like the study of the races. It's like horrible. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, just changing your view of like what a native person should look like. And when someone like tells you, or if you find out that one of your friends is indigenous, not like what percentage of are you? Like which which grandparent? Like yeah. how long? Like all these kinds of things. Like, how do you like your alcohol? Like just like there's another thing, you can, you can Google all this, like, as well. <laughs> but it's like, and another resource, I guess another resource is my 41 day project. Um, three years ago, I did the 41 days, which is like 41 days of ceremony, where I created a necklace each day. And then I shared a lot of like, thought, uh, statistics and a lot of like experiences that I myself have had. Just like being ambiguous, that word, I couldn't say that again. Anyways, just being people not knowing who I am. <laughs> um, I'll put all this in the episode description so everyone can go and find everything easily. Because people don't like to... It's a lot of resources. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of resources. And it's like, it's overwhelming, but it's, 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 it's good work. It's um, it's work that not just like whether or not you care about Indigenous people in Canada or not, it's going to help you or whether or not you are in Canada or not, but it's going to help you deconstruct like a lot of things that have happened around the world and the dispossession of Indigenous lands all over the world because you have the Sami people in Russia, you have like the Maori in New, New Zealand, you have Australian Aboriginals, you have like, and it's all the same story. <laughs> and it's all like a continued genocide. So, and a lot of it just like, the yeah, origins all like have like one point at a certain point, but um, 
it's definitely something that's like worth deconstructing especially now as like like the lands being hurt so much and like as I feel like we're coming to like a turning point where we're understand like with COVID is like kind of revealing a lot of like the gaps in our systems and where people are hurting and even with the lockdown we're having a lot of proof like that huge hole in our ozone layer yeah patched up yeah. and it's like if we don't if people don't see like the ramifications after this i don't i really don't know what we're gonna do <laughs> More. yeah like even the the map that was being shown of like um the air quality over like china specifically and i believe italy mm. and how it was like in the red zone two months prior to their quarantine and made it all the way back to green by the end of quarantine and it's like for how many years of damage it didn't take much time of just pretty much no industry to let the land fix itself or the air clean itself and i'm hoping that we learn something from an industrial aspect so to oh. take care of the air quality and the land around us same here and it's like on a side note it's like i'm a, I'm a kid of the 80s and i feel like all the cartoons that came out of the 80s and the early 90s were like our environment is dying and we need to save it like <laughs> like fern gully that movie fern gully um there's like the animals of farthington forest there's like captain planet there's I, like if you go through and you look and I'm like, how are we still here? Like, yeah. How are we still not like getting it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I think yeah. <laughs> we really touched all of the points we wanted to. <laughs> There's so many, so many different points. Yeah. But like, let just let me be your like, gateway to your learning like that's like that's like it seems like so many topics and a lot of people are just going to be discouraged and be like whatever yeah but it's like just let that be your gateway like and then you dive into wherever you need to dive in after that yeah I'm not saying to sit there and oh sorry <laughs> i'm just gonna say a lot of people don't know where to start so this is another start topic. where you're standing yeah and just like work out from there and check out decolonization is not a metaphor um check out my 41 day project which has been over for three years but all the resources are still there um i have it on my facebook page and also my instagram handle and i present the information very point form very if you're just starting it's easy to digest yeah. before you start going into like the more heavier detailed topics so i have uh one question where did you where does the birch trail uh name come from how did you uh well birch birch trees are super prominent for me like they're super prominent growing up but they're also super prominent for like a lot of indigenous like nations especially like Mi'kmaq people like a lot of our canoes are made out of birch bark. Um, there's like traditional um, birch bark biting crafts. Um, and it's like weird correlations that I just like saw growing up, like birch trees being very important um, throughout my life. And it wasn't even something I discovered until I started doing etching and like resin work and stuff like that. So it took me like a week to come up with the birch trail <laughs> or two weeks. And it started off as something like, on the birch so, like a really long name and then i just like i put it down to the birch trail and i always get the question like is my name birch and i'm like i wish that's a cool <laughs> name like i wish my name was birch but it's just michelle <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah that's um, I've been doing the birch trail for seven years now, but I've been doing like resin work for almost 10 years now. Okay. And that's like, that's like my main, my main thing that I'm doing right now. Yeah, and you do some, yeah, all of your work is so 
so pretty. I just mm -hmm. want it all. <laughs> I do like a, it's like a mixture of like medicines, like traditional medicines and plants, and I use resin to preserve them. So I always just my 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 slogan is like another way to wear your medicine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, and it's really funny, like, because we talk about, like, how people try to engage with Indigenous people and they're not realizing, like, something that they could be saying as, like, a microaggression. Yeah. And one of the, one of my favorite question from a client that I met at a market, and she went to find me. She's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm actually the organizer of the show, so I'm not at my table. <laughs> and she's like, do you live in the woods? And I was like, what? Like, the woods of Oshlaga, which is like a neighborhood in Montreal. <laughs> I wish I lived in the woods. I don't like, no, I don't live in the woods. Who do you think I live? <laughs> that one was my favorite one. That was my favorite one. And then you'll get a lot of people that will like um, critique you or just critique like indigenous artists like, oh, it's so modern. And I'm like, but like, what do you mean modern? Like, oh, it's not like native art. And it's like, but I, I'm a native person. Yeah. Who it. So like, it's native art. Like, I don't, people have like an idea. Yeah. They have yeah, they have an idea of a box that we're in and that we're only allowed to use like four or five colors. Yeah. And it's like, there's like, a, like this misconception that like we can't, like the noble savage that I keep talking about, we can't exist as modern people when we've been like, we were very modernized, like pre, pre contact. We're still modernized people now. Like, um, so many artist friends of mine have like issues where people will go up and be like, but you're, what does your art mean? And is it spirits? And is it this and that? And they're just like, not all of us do that. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to, um, like, how do, how do people buy your jewelry or anything that you need? Do you do so, order or? Right now, I'm uh, paralyzed with mask orders. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I have a very small select amount of stock if someone ends up messaging me on Instagram and saying, hey, do you have something available right now? But how I usually do is I'll post my work in collections. And then usually, usually they sell out within 24 to 48 hours. And the reason I do that is just because like taking on so many custom orders, it's gonna paralyze me for like months. Yeah. Whereas I just wanna make what I wanna make. Like this is my art and then offer that out. <laughs> And I do, I love doing custom orders though. Custom orders are awesome. So if you have an idea, you can write me and we can work something out. Cool. Um, but it might take a little while right now. Yeah. But I don't like my website is just basically my portfolio as it is right now. I haven't been able to post regularly. Cool. So and, people should wait until after you're done your mass masks order. <laughs> Well, like, if you want to write me, I'll put it, I, I have a waiting list right now. Okay, cool. And, um, yeah, and hope, hopefully I'll be able to start doing a lot more jewelry collections soon. Um, I was supposed to be at Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto, but that's been postponed. So eventually I'll be, I'll be there whenever it gets rescheduled. <laughs> so that's another way you can purchase from me in the future. Um, we could probably talk for another hour and a half. <laughs> I know, right? Like, I'm good if you want to keep talking, <laughs> but if you have something to do. Um, no, I mean, you know. If you had any questions or if you want me to specifically go into something. I don't have any more questions. But... No, I th honestly, I think. I think it's good. Yeah, I think just being a gateway to right now is perfect um mm -hmm. but maybe when you start doing more of like your jewelry stuff again when you're not mm -hmm. so paralyzed in your orders let us know because we'd love to have you on to just talk about that more mm -hmm. um 
yeah, because that's super fun. And I know COVID is just cramping everybody's style anyway, so. You know what? Yeah, it is. And it's like, take it, take COVID how you want it. Like, it's, you'll have so many people that be like, if you're not doing anything during COVID and like figuring out your life, then you're not doing anything. And it's just yeah. like, you want to know what? Some people just need rest. Yeah. Some people are discovering things that they should have discovered a long time ago and we're all at our own pace and COVID has been actually good to me despite it's not it's not a good situation but um I haven't sewn in forever and now I'm sewing again which is pretty cool um and I've discovered quite a few things so there's going to be like some big changes coming up for me in the next month. So that's going to be exciting to update. Cool. Yeah. Cool. But thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for and I, I hope people learned something about their, their uh, O Canada on native land. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for <laughs> being a bit full of information and um, answering our question because yeah. it's been great talking to you yeah so i hope hope you guys have a good day yes you too mm-hmm. you too and it, i'm gonna listen to this episode because i'm one of those crazy people that's like did i sound like a total idiot <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's fair <laughs> okay. i listen to most of our episodes um especially the ones where i'm like did i say something stupid did that come out weird yeah. Oh, here's an idea. When Fashion Week ha- when Fashion Week happens, I'll be in Toronto, and we can get together in person. Yes. Let's yeah, that would be great, actually. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. That'd be super fun. Mm. All right. Well, we'll we'll touch base for the, the future. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Um, we'll talk to you later. We'll talk to yeah. You later. I'm gonna go sit beside my AC now. <laughs> all, right. No. all right so take care we'll chat soon and if you they can you can write me if you want me to clarify in anything or send you stuff for the show notes awesome cool. thank you no problem see you